Hello, I'm David Gauntlet. This is a video that I've made for the Artisan Conference. Full title, Artisan, Crafting Alternative Economies, Making Alternative Lives. A conference at the University of the West of England in Bristol, UK, in September 2018. Uh, they asked me to speak at their conference and I said it sounded like a really interesting conference, because it does. Uh, but I'm in Canada, so that'd be difficult. They said, could you make a video or something anyway? So here is a video or something. Anyway, uh, I'm joined today by a sturdy prop, which is uh, this. Hello, I am a computer. I have questions. Let's go. Okay, so I've got a computer asking me some questions. So here's the first one. What is an artisan? What is an artisan? Um, first thing is, I'm not the expert in how you define artisans. Uh, but it was interesting to me to be asked to speak at this conference. I don't normally talk about artisans as such. I'd normally talk about making and creativity and giving people opportunities to do that. And then the artisan movement is an interesting dimension of that. Uh, I guess I understand artisanal making as being to do with a, a careful, slow, thoughtful, handmade kind of process. It's often artisanal making is thought of as being like the opposite or it's, it's in contrast to industrial making. It's not done in big factories with big machines. It's more careful, personal, individual. There's the idea that it's kind of rooted in tradition, which I guess it is. Uh, but we can also think about new ways of having artisanal making. And the rise of artisans recently shows that uh, artisans have found some ways of using new technologies to spread the word about their craft, to attract other people, to interact with other people, to share ideas and inspirations, which is what I always like. Um, but it's a particular kind of making, isn't it? Because it involves a level of skill, a level of skill that most people don't have, I guess. That would be why people are willing to pay money for it. There's the money dimension. People are often uh, selling artisanal wares. It's a kind of form of branding, isn't it? It's a way of marking out the stuff that you make in order to charge a higher than you might otherwise find price for it because it's been carefully made by a personal group of people who wanted to stamp their mark on the thing to make it sort of personal and interesting and engaging because you can see within it that it's been made by actual human beings, not in a factory. That's a crucial dimension of it, isn't it? What are the central qualities of artisanal making? Central qualities of artisanal making, I've just listed a few. But I like to think that uh, I read in a book edited by Geoffrey Crossick, who later on in his life went on to become head of the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. Uh, but back in 1997, 21 years ago, uh, he edited a book called The Artisan and the European Town, 1500 to 1900, which is uh, an interesting collection of things. I like his introduction in it, though. Um, this, it, it makes within this book the point that artisanship came to mean much more than work. It's also to do with three key things. Artisanship as occupation. It's a kind of job that people had or have. Second, it's about social position. It's a particular kind of role within a community that you're the artisan that brings things to the community, I guess. But third, and perhaps most importantly, uh, artisanship as identity, as being uh, not simply a thing that you do amongst other things, but a thing that you are as an artisan that is the person that does this, has these particular skills, plays this particular role. That's obviously a nice dimension to it. Uh, Jeffrey Crossick also talks about how 
sorry if you know this already, artisan experts. Um, but uh, Kostik also talks, I like this, about how artisans were like villages in the sense that by the sort of 19th century, people looked back on the idea of English villages and artisans, craftspeople in those villages as, as representing all the things they dearly loved, which they thought the Industrial Revolution was perhaps sweeping away. And no doubt in the, the rise of artisan making that we see today, it's, it's obviously a kind of response to mass manufactured, less individual, less handmade stuff, um, and, and wanting to support those kind of makers. People buy into the idea of buying artisan breads and artisan everything else. Uh, because they want to support individual, local, interesting makers that do this stuff. This is all basic stuff about artisans, obviously. I'd also like to highlight, of course, to not so much to people at this conference, but to anybody else watching this, that, um, that artisanal making is many, many things. You know this at the conference at the University of West of England because there's many papers about lots of different things. There's uh, artisanship in terms of craft beer and motorcycles and jewellery making and all kind of handicrafts but um, it, it's, a, it's a broad spectrum if you think of it as being one thing it's artisan foods as well I've already mentioned um, if you think of artisans as being one kind of thing or being about like a craft fair type making it is of course not just that um, artisanal food and drink alcohol cheese comes up a lot I read a whole article about cheese. There's something funny about cheese making. It's a great, great thing when people are making cheese. It's just the word cheese. Um, this art is an approach. It brings the identity of the maker forward. Yeah, I think the artisan approach brings the idea of the maker forward. Um, it draws attention to the fact that this is a thing that is made, made by particular individuals or groups with particular beliefs about how things should be done, a level of care, a kind of love put into it, I suppose. Um, and all, all of that obviously seems really nice. I am going to mention some, a less rosy view of the artisan form of branding and discourse a bit later on. And it highlights the process of how things are made. It highlights the process of how things are made, that's right. Uh, I guess with mass-produced goods, you just get them, and you might wonder about how they're made, but that's certainly not really drawn to your attention. It's kind of hidden, uh, purposely invisible. Whereas, artisan made things or things that include the word artisan in how they're sold um, are seeking to draw attention to how they're made and it's this idea of care, slowness, links to tradition, craft, a learned wise way of doing things. Of course also um, the word artisan is, is cheaply used by the mass marketers as well. Um, I recently got some bread from Costco. Costco is the opposite of anything artisanal. Uh, it's a massive warehouse supermarket, but the bread said it was artisanal bread. It said artisan bread. You've seen this kind of thing. Uh, and you think, because, because it's a baguette, because it's a bit rustic looking, it's not really made by seasoned artisans. Is it? But um, but the idea appeals to people. That's why Costco is trying to pretend that it's not Costco, and it's actually selling artisanal products, which it is not. Obviously. How does this link to making is connecting? How does this link to making is connecting? An interesting question, my computer friend. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote a book. Which happened to get mentioned just there somehow. Uh, I wrote a book in 2011, came out in 2011, called Making is Connecting, and the second edition, which I happen to have here, uh, was published um, 
just a couple of months ago. And that idea of making is connecting. The idea is all about how people flourish when they have opportunities to be creative in their lives. If you have a society which does not provide people with such opportunities, then you've got a society which is going to wither and not at all flourish. By the end of the 20th century, we'd got a culture where people basically just enjoyed stuff made by other people. In terms of our entertainment and culture, it was stuff made by other people, and 99.8% of us were people consuming stuff made by others. That's not to say whether it's good or bad stuff. You know, a lot of it was perfectly entertaining and interesting, um, and, and, and of a certain quality level. Then the rise of the artisan in the 21st century is something to be welcomed. It, it highlights makers and the creative process and making things with care and so on, as previously mentioned. Um, it's slightly difficult for me because it creates a sort of elite class of those people who are the best and greatest makers to be celebrated, uh, as distinct from everybody else. On the other hand, it doesn't, strictly speaking, have gatekeepers. Anyone can set themselves up as an artisan. You would need to be able to achieve a certain level of quality, but then that's the case with almost all things. Um, so it's not like the media industries of the past where you simply couldn't become part of them unless you managed to tick through, tick lots of boxes and, and know the right people or be extremely lucky, <laughs> uh, often, be born into the right kind of families that are going to mean that you have a trajectory that gets you to there. Um, the artisan ideal is much more open than that, so that's good. Um, but on the other hand, it creates this kind of class of makers distinct from everybody else. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, I think. Um, this artisan stuff is like William Morris time travelers from the future. This artisan stuff is like William Morris time travellers from the future. What can this mean? Uh, what my computer friend is referring to is the the thing from about William Morris, which I talk about in Making is Connecting, uh, which answers the question of why William Morris, the Victorian arts and crafts thinker and maker, um, it sort of explains what he was doing. Because on the one hand, William Morris was a socialist and strongly believed in fairness and equality and wanting to have uh, riches shared around for all and yet at the same time made in his role as a maker made distinctly elite expensive products that could only really be bought by the rich they finally made books and uh, other furnishings and all kinds of different things that William Morris made um, the explanation for what William Morris is doing when he makes these very fine things that only really rich people can afford to buy is that these objects are like time travellers from the future. Meaning that they are a glimpse of the world that we wish we could have. William Morris single-handedly can't change the whole world or the whole economic system in which he finds himself. Uh, what he can do is give us glimpses of how things could be and obviously that really connects with uh, artisanal culture where the idea is that your artisan bread, all bread could be like that. It isn't. And not everyone can enjoy that kind of bread. But there's that wish that they could. And it's an example of how things could be that even in the world we have now, you could have things like that. Um, and then the same thing extends across vinyl records, craft beers, uh, and all finally made things. Uh, they're examples of how things could be and the fact that you have artisans making those things and making a living shows that it's possible. Not sure if it's possible on, on an industrial scale, but then we're not wanting it to be on an industrial scale anyway. Communities of people making things for a largely local audience or population or community um, is good and powerful. So William Morris would approve. Picking up on uh, other themes from Makey's Connecting, 
and the, the sort of thinkers I talked about there. I believe there's another question. What would Ivan Illich say? What would Ivan Illich say? I always called him Ivan Illich, but it's Ivan, Ivan Illich now. Um, Ivan Illich, the guy who wrote Deschooling Society in 1968, and in 1973 he wrote Tools for Conviviality, um, which is about the idea that uh, systems can often get much too big. As society evolves, you get systems which start off seeming nice and helpful and good, like in the school's example from his book Deschooling Society, obviously the idea of a school is nice. You have a, a place that people can go to and, and they do learning. They engage in learning, they are taught, they, they thrive together and, and work and collaborate and, and learn things, and that's all good. Um, obviously the idea is sound, but then society grows and grows and schooling becomes a more and more rigid system so that you know it becomes more like a factory essentially and you've got uh, a unified kind of experience happening in multiple locations around a nation or around the world um, testing comes in league tables ultimately uh, turn up and, and, and turn the whole thing into a, a situation which works against the original intentions because you start to just, instead of creating interesting thinkers, well then you get people who are being programmed to learn a certain bunch of stuff and it becomes factory-like, churning out uh, citizens who are supposed to think a particular way and have learned a particular bunch of stuff specified probably by your government. And, and so it's not what the original intention was. And Tools for Conviviality talks about how we can set up all many different kinds of uh, information systems, entertainment, uh, modes of learning, ways of being, which, which start off with great intentions and then just become bigger and bigger and more industrial and at some point cease to serve the function for which they originally intended. And Ivan Illich wants us to get to a place where people have a much more direct engagement with the world in which they live, where they're not just consuming stuff made by others, but are makers of their own worlds. That's the really powerful bit in Ivan Illich for me. Um, it's about bringing to the, the world and your culture that you are part of, your own stuff, being part of it, being a maker within that culture. That's what's really crucial. Uh, so that everybody has a voice, everybody's contributing. Um, and so then how does Ivan Illich uh, link up with the artisan approach? I guess he'd be pretty happy if, if we've got lots of artisans bringing their own, their own creative work, their own self to a community. If we've got lots of different artisans bringing their own thing that they like to do within a space, uh, that seems pretty good. Again, a little bit, that notion of singular expertise perhaps gets in the way. If, if you're the person that makes the artisan breads or the person who makes the craft beer, then you're, you're making a distinct and interesting contribution to your local culture and community. Um, in a sense, I think Illich would like us all to be participating in, in multiple different ways to make life interesting, not specialising in one way. But certainly specialising in one way is much better than the industrial systems that he would be opposed to when they get too big. And the artisanal approach is a rejection of those kind of systems and saying, can't we get back to something smaller, more knowable, more homemade? So, so we're okay there too. So let's have another question. What about you, too? That was... What about YouTube? YouTube. Uh, well, uh, what about YouTube? Is YouTube a place of artisanal making? Is YouTube a place of artisanal making? Uh, YouTube wouldn't normally be what you think of as a place of artisanal making, would it? Because we're normally thinking about handcrafted kind of, you know, bread, beer, jewelry, furniture, not YouTube, um, but YouTube for me is a kind of archetypal 
making his connecting kind of platform. Uh, obviously, there are all the concerns about it's owned by Google, it's aggregating lots of data about you, etc. Um, but compared to other social networks, it, it's not it's not nearly so bad as those ones. It's not Facebook. YouTube isn't. YouTube is a place that hosts a vast array of things made by individuals who want to say something or make something and, and get it out there to other people. And uh, and, that, and they're not doing it because they're trying to make money. They're doing it because they want to share ideas and experiences. So on the one hand, uh, YouTube does kind of make money. For a long time, it didn't make money, you know. But um, but for, it does essentially create economic value for Google because people create all this stuff for free and uh, Google slash YouTube is mostly able to keep almost all of the money that they get from advertisers on that platform. Uh, but we're not, we're not dwelling on that here. We're dwelling on YouTube as a space where people can, which they can, they can make stuff and put it there. That's what I'm doing with this video. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to stick it on YouTube and for other people to be able to see it. I would never expect to get paid for this video and if it wasn't for YouTube, I'd be having to pay for some other form of video hosting anyway. So in, in this kind of case, it's fine. And there's literally, I was gonna say billions, certainly hundreds of millions of, of people in the same situation. Uh, eager to put stuff onto YouTube, not because anybody's told them to, not because they're doing it for their job or for qualification or to make money. In some cases, people want to go on to make money in different ways and, it, and, and they can. Um, but often it's just people who want to share ideas, share some culture or create some culture and share it with others. Um, is it artisanal? I think the process of making a video is a careful, slow, time-consuming kind of process. It's not, it's not fast food. It's, it's pretty slow cooking. Uh, it takes preparation, a lot of editing time, not on this video, <laughs> because I'm not as hard working as some people, but on other videos, um, a lot of preparation and then making and then editing before you then put out something that's actually quite a small little little gem of a thing. YouTube is full of really great three or five minute videos made by people who put a lot of care into it. They're wanting to bring something to culture. It's not local or geographically bound. I saw some definitions of uh, artisan making which, which included that. Could you hang on a second? Let's just see if I've got that. Yeah, look, in an article by Blundell and Smith about reinventing artisanal knowledge and practice, which is about innovation within craft and looking, taking a sort of innovation perspective on what artisans are doing today. Um, they say in that, we define artisanal knowledge as proprietary situated and often location specific ways of knowing, characterized by the application of skills, regular recourse to personal judgment, and extensive handworking involving individuals and small collaborative groups. And so on the one hand, uh, making videos for YouTube doesn't sound like that when we were talking about situated and often location specific ways of knowing. Um, there, there's a kind of local knowledge of people who've seen previous YouTube videos, they know about the culture of YouTube, the sorts of videos that we sort of, we sort of make. But that's, you know, there's not one sort of YouTube video that's extremely vast, really. But you know, there's a certain way of doing things, I guess. Uh, there, was a certain, there are certain cultural expectations that go with it. So, um, so local to YouTube, there are certain ways of knowing. But obviously, it's not location specific. It's a thing that goes all around the world. And people making videos hope their videos are going to go all around the world, too. So, you know. <laughs> um, but then when it was talking about uh, application of skills, yes. Regular recourse to personal judgment, yes. Uh, and extensive handworking. I say, yeah, you know, the, the careful process, editing. Editing a thing is, is very much like other handicrafts, I think. You're, you're literally using your hands to do it and you're often making tiny little adjustments to, to tweak a bit. You're taking a bit out of video, you're putting something in, you're moving bits around. It's, it's not the same as, you know, woodwork. <laughs> Obviously, in certain ways, but also in, in ways it is quite a lot like uh, like quite a lot of handicrafts or jewelry making. Even crafting a three-minute gem of a video. Again, this isn't one of those. This is a long, uncrafted video in many ways. 
But crafting a, a, an excellent three to five minute video about something, that's, you know, I think it's like jewelry making. You may or may not agree, discuss. YouTube, of course, is part of a industrial kind of system, the, the Google owned platform, YouTube. But artisans do work in systems. Artisans with their craft breweries and their artisan bakeries are working within the capitalist system a little bit on the margins compared to some other ones. But, um, but also I'm talking about people working on the margins of YouTube rather than being like the, the biggest YouTubers or the, or the biggest pop stars on YouTube. So I think YouTube and other internet-based platforms, this isn't just about YouTube, but YouTube is an example. YouTube is a place where a form of artisanal making takes place. And of course the internet more generally, in the even more pure world of people just making websites or online things which are not hosted on a social media kind of platform or a platform owned by Facebook or, or Google or whoever, um, which of course you can still do. These days we talk a lot about social media, but then there's the whole world of the internet and stuff you can put on the internet as just for example, as I do on my own website, davidgauntlet.com uh, and you know, uh, millions of other people do on other sites that they own and pay for themselves because they want to get stuff out there and they don't want the data to be owned by other people or by big corporations. Um, we can still do that. And so that kind of website making is even more artisanal. Again, a very slow, careful process involving design, craft, thinking, knowledge, uh, relationship to how other people do this kind of thing and knowledge of that kind of culture. So digital media culture is what I'm saying. The point is digital media culture is also in some way part of artisanal culture, the 21st century version of artisan culture. And obviously there's a relationship between how the, in the 21st century you have this rise of interest in artisanal things and also the kind of online parallel which is uh, you know where artisanal making is the opposite of big supermarkets, Costco etc. Um, then you've got artisanal websites which are the opposite of Netflix. They're not part of a big industrial money making machine. They're things made by people with care and love because they want to express something in the world. They want to create culture. In a sense, it's a shame that we often have to do that on sites like YouTube owned by Google, which is part of a big industrial thing. But the culture within that um, is still extremely diverse and interesting and not in any way controlled or determined or prescribed by the big corporations. So. As ever, there's a kind of fudge between what we would most ideally like to do and what we actually do do. And that is the fudge which is also made by all kinds of other artisanal makers as well as they engage in certain economic practices to get their stuff out there. And they have to think about pricing and selling and distribution and, and their, their place within a marketplace. Um, they do because that's the kind of society we live in. But they're doing their best. They're trying to do something distinctive and interesting as far as they can. And what about music? Today's DIY music makers? Uh, today's DIY music makers, they're in a similar boat to uh, YouTube people I just talked about, I guess. But in some ways, uh, musicians <laughs> are now able to be more independent, do, start, do more stuff for themselves, not be part of anybody else's company or content provision service. Um, because in the past, as you know, when people who wanted to make music and have it heard by other people uh, and maybe to make some money from it, had to work with record companies. That, that was the system, you know about that. Um, and so you, you have your work manufactured and distributed by somebody else who's able to express a lot of preferences about what they want you to be doing and will say yay or nay to whether they're going to uh, distribute your work and so on. Um, it's a particular system where people have to work with particular kinds of other people 
those people may not have been such nice people. For women working in the music industry in the past, and of course still today, but especially in the past when you had to, to get on, you had to kind of subsume some of your, your wishes and ideas to what uh, a male in dominated industry was dictating and asking for and they would want you to do all different kinds of things about how you present yourself that may or may not make you feel comfortable and to a certain extent you could say no go away but then you can't if you do that very much then you can no longer distribute your music and have it heard by other people so that's no good the today's digital culture enables people to set up their own record labels their own distribution and they can promote they can so Digital technology, as you know, means that in the comfort of your own home, you can entirely make the music yourself, the production side, you can do all that at home, but also you can get it out into the world, you can sell it, you can promote it and, and work to get it noticed. And that is a lot of work. But you can now do that without being part of uh, anybody else's system, except for the global system of the internet, of course. Um, and often it helps if you've got a like a distribution company like Compact, which basically exists to help people get their stuff out there. But they're they're not calling the shots in any way. They're not. Uh, they wouldn't ask you to do something that you don't want to do because that's not their role. They're just there to help you distribute work. Um, and you can even do without them. Of course, you can just have a site on the internet which distributes or sells your stuff with a very direct relationship to. The, the, the culture, the people that you want to listen to your work. Drawing attention to your work is still hard, hard work. Getting people to know about your stuff so that then that will happen when they actually come to hear it, that is still hard. But at least it's possible. And before, you, know, you just couldn't do it. You could be a musician that made music that was heard by local people that you could play it to. Uh, now you can and then there was the system with record companies where you had to do what the record company said, basically. Uh, now we've got beyond that point to a point where you can get your stuff to a community of fans or followers, where nobody's telling you what to do, and where your fans and followers can tell you what they like you doing, give you lots of feedback. Um, it can be a positive and nourishing experience for those makers. It can also be a lonely and depressing experience. It's hard work, but then, you know, creative work is often hard work, and artisanal making is often hard work. Um, so thinking of the continuum between artisanal making and and today's often electronic music making, it's, it's all part of the same thing. Um, and maybe there's lessons to be learned between the two groups who typically don't talk to each other at all, I would think. Okay, so... This art is an idea. Isn't it kind of exclusive? Exclusive? Uh, uh, you mean... exclusive in a good way? Bad. In a bad way. Exclusive. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean... The artisanal idea is obviously, by definition, uh, somewhat exclusive because it indicates a, a level of craft and skill and practice which is above the level of machines and above the level of somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. So in that sense, of course, it is relatively exclusive. Um, a certain level of quality and care we like, don't we? You like inclusive things, right? I do like inclusive things. Um, I'm, I'm excited about platforms for creativity, which is a phrase that I use to indicate any kind of event, environment, thing, toy, platform, digital or otherwise, which kind of invites people in and gives them chances to play and create and work together and inspire each other so that one person makes a thing and somebody else sees that and they don't necessarily 
uh, want to make that thing or copy that thing, but they're inspired just in the sense of, oh, they, they, you know, they did that, so maybe I could do this, and then this person's like, oh, you know, you've done that, then maybe I could do this, and you get a kind of scaffolding of creativity within a platform for creativity. That, that's what I think is most exciting and what society and culture needs. So then do we need more exclusive ways of thinking about creativity? I'd say not so much. I guess there's different ways of doing things. So you can have artisanal making in a society in a way that is quite open and shows the process and is done in a way that sort of includes the idea that you could do this too. Here we are, we know what we're doing and we've made this, it's good, but also you could build your skills and make things like this or make something you know totally different but be a person who makes and makes whatever you're interested in too and become better at it so that people really like what you do that's all that's all fine and good um so so you can present artisanship as just an unattainable amazing level of skill where the implication is you could never do this we're great we can do this you could never do this, but we're willing to sell it to you. And that would be my less favoured version of artisanship for sure. But I think an open and inclusive approach to making, even within the more esoteric or high level artisan fields, it is to be welcomed and is good. But I think it's important for artisans to hold on to that ethos, to not get so excited about their very high level of craft and quality that they kick away the ladder that is offered to others. I think they should always be offering that ladder, that, a series of steps up to where they are, or at least sort of suggesting that it is attainable. We came up to this position where we have this level of skill, but you could too. That's the important bit. Um, so you can be making things that are, are really high quality, really nicely, really well done, really thoughtfully done. Of course, that's great. But it shouldn't be presented that, you know, we're just amazing and you'll never achieve this level. It should always be presented as, you can get to this level, then that's good. It's about tone, isn't it? It's about how you do it. It's about whether you do it in a just purely fancy pants middle class, we are in a particular kind of bubble away from everybody else kind of way. Or if you do it in an, an open human kind of way, which is just about, we are people we can make things, we can use our imagination to do good stuff, and we can all do that. And if it's got that kind of vibe to it, then that's obviously much more preferable. A form of artisaning, which is just about reinforcing how middle-class people feel good about themselves, that, that's not what we want. Is it a feminist approach? Is it a feminist approach? Okay. Interesting. Um, may, maybe it's not for me to say, but I think there's certain dimensions which are interesting from a feminist approach. Uh, taking the, the, the broad popular idea that the personal is political, I think artisanal making gives you opportunities to bring personal knowledge and experience into the world of culture through making. Some forms of making may uh, enable that more than others, of course. Um, but there's, there's certainly an avenue there. The way in which uh, women or others or just groups could, could set up independently, not be part of existing systems, but make stuff themselves in a way that they want to without being bossed about by others who may be male, patriarchal kind of others. Uh, that's got to be good. Um, and it, it's like the example I used earlier about uh, some female musicians who I've talked to as part of the research for Making is Connecting, who have found a way to circumvent the male-dominated uh, record industry by, you know, uh, by using an artisanal kind of approach where they do it all themselves, the DIY kind of approach. Um, so there's feminist elements within it, but um, as, as we talked about just now, uh, the exclusive kind of nature of artisanal making, if done in an exclusive kind of way, that would go against, I'd have thought, inclusive kind of feminist ideals. So we need to find a balance. It's about how you do it. It's about the attitude that you bring to a thing. Artisanal making doesn't just exist as a, as a, as a particular mode or way of doing things. 
it, there's, there's endless different ways in which you could do it, and you could do it nicer or not so nice. This artisan approach seems slow and careful and deliberate. It's not like the fast and fizzy internet world that you like. Okay. Uh, this artisan approach seems slow and careful and deliberate, not like the fast and fizzy internet world that I like. Um, I guess one thing you could take from this is that the, the fast and fizzy internet world has got something to learn from the slower, more careful, artisanal kind of approach. The worst sides of today's internet are the, the super fast things, the constant flow of ping, ping, ping things from social media and, and also the, the ways in which some of those companies operate, move fast and break things, being a popular slogan in Facebook world. Um, the more careful, slow way of making from, uh, from artisans is what leads to high quality YouTube videos rather than just random people's, you know, the worst side of people on the internet is just people bashing out fast, thoughtless arguments and having, uh, you know, being abusive and having rows online, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and thoughtlessly perhaps churning stuff onto social media in ways that are just kind of show-offy and, and not conversational. Um, and the more slow, deliberative approach to making, which the artisan approach requires, is also what produces the nicest things on the internet, the, the carefully made videos, the nicely done websites, uh, the, the music which takes absolutely ages to make, because it does, music. Um, I think that, that is what the, uh, the digital world can learn from artisans. There's already a relationship with these, between these two things, they're not separate anymore. And the positive flow from artisan world to digital world is, is one that we should encourage. Okay, now, to sum up, what's the important thing? What's the important thing? The important thing is about people having opportunities to be creative. The artisan approach puts identity and the creative process at the forefront. It's about who you are as a person and what you bring to that creativity, the way in which you do it, the care and attention and thoughtfulness and, and love and compassion that you bring to the thing that you make. That's what uh, unites the positive side of artisanal making and also digital culture, I think. People being able to do what they want to do, having the ability to make that thing, get it out there, get it seen or available to people. That's all the most uh, vital stuff. And the ability to have a kind of conversation about that as well. So uh, here I am, I like this kind of stuff, I make this kind of stuff and I share it with you. But then the ability for us to have a conversation about how that was done or the chance for us to inspire each other about different ways of making, different approaches to making, a different kind of philosophy of just, oh, you know, just the, the openness to make something different and to be, to have the courage to put that out there, to be seen by others. And then that, that might make somebody else think, oh, okay, so you did that and you felt able to do that, so then I could do this. And then somebody else thinking, well, if that person felt that they had the voice or ability to do this thing, then I could do this other thing that I've been thinking about or wanting to do or it sparked up a whole new idea of something I could do. That whole conversational network around making uh, is the powerful thing that binds together, I would hope, artisanal making and digital culture. That's it. Stop now. Thank you. And it's time to stop. Okay. Time to stop. Okay. Uh, thank you. I hope there was something in this video of interest and uh, thanks for spending the time with me. Uh, I'm easily contactable. If you Google David Gauntlet, there's ways to see my other stuff on my website and to, to contact me. Website is davidgauntlet.com. Um, so maybe we can have more of a conversation about this kind of stuff. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye.